Welcome back to the Game Master's Domain, where I make homebrew for D&D. If you want to support me in making this channel my full-time job, then you can follow me over on Patreon, where you can grab this pack and many others under the $1 tier. Also make sure to like, subscribe, and ring the bell to catch all of our videos. This is episode 54, The Way of the Stormfist, for anyone who was disappointed with The Way of the Four Elements. So, just about everyone. And make sure to stick around until the end of the video, since I have a question for my Avatar fans, regarding something that I may or may not have started working on already. With that said though, let's see what kind of violence these supposedly pacifist airbenders are capable of. So I don't think it's much of a hot take to say that the Way of the Four Elements monk, the subclass that is 100% just the Avatar from, well, Avatar? Uh, no, not the blue aliens, we're talking about this guy. The last remaining airbender in the show. I mean, it's already kind of in the name, Avatar the Last Airbender. At least until he has some kids, but we're not going to get into that today. Instead, we're going to focus specifically on airbending. In the world of Avatar, airbending is an extremely powerful bending style, but it's mostly used by pacifist monks that keep to themselves. It's also the only bending type to not have a subtype. Firebenders get to learn lightning bending, waterbenders can bend ice, steam, and strong ones can even bend your blood, and of course earthbenders get both metal bending and lava bending. But airbenders? Nah, they, they do their own thing which is just air. And honestly, that's fine. Airbending is already kinda busted, and they do not need a subtype on top of that. For example, airbenders can fly, blast away enemies with gusts of wind, block attacks with wind barriers, extend the range of their attacks with more wind, increase their speed by reducing air resistance, make blades of air, and just so much more. Including, um, oh you know, just Pulling the oxygen out of people's lungs? Literally taking your breath away, just maybe not in the way that you might have hoped. So yeah, I think it's a good thing that the people that can just delete your ability to breathe aren't really all that interested in hurting people. But that does not mean these monks won't defend themselves in their homes. Just look at Aang's master, Monk Gyatsu, who is found surrounded by the corpses of dead firebenders. So clearly, despite not really wanting to hurt anyone, these pacifist monks are still very capable of doing so if they're pushed into a corner. So to go with kind of the two different sides of airbending, one which is more than happy to just sit up in their home and be away from everyone, and the other side that is able to steal your oxygen from you, you get two different features when you take this subclass at level 3. So you know how Aang became an airbending master by making his own airbending technique, that being the air scooter? I love the air scooter, and in fact I love it so much that I put it in this subclass. I didn't call it the air scooter for obvious reasons, instead I called it the calm, letting you spend one key point as a bonus action to hover off the ground for one minute. During this minute, you are unaffected by difficult terrain or hazards on the ground. You also get to bump your movement speed up by 5 feet for that entire minute, which is on top of how crazy fast monks already are. You also get to cast the Gust Cantrip using your Wisdom score as the casting mod. And the same goes for your second ability, where you get to learn the Thunderclap Cantrip. And since these are both cantrips, they don't cost any key, you can just use them as much as you want. But I didn't give this ability its own separate name, the Storm, just for a cantrip. The main effect of the storm is to give you that extra range that I talked about airbenders having before. You spend one key point, and for the rest of your turn, your attacks deal 1d10 extra thunder damage, and their range is increased by 10 feet. But that is only scratching the surface of what airbenders can do, and like I said before, they have a lot of different abilities. So let's see what else I pulled from that. Oh, and you might notice some stuff left over from the Way of the Four Elements, because 
despite how kind of bad it was, there are some outliers that are actually good or even kind of fun. And one of those is a big part of the level 6 ability, Fists of Thunder. It's like a buffed up version of the Storm, but it does cost 2 key points out of your current total of 6. Whenever you give someone a good smack, whether that be with your hands, your legs, a monk weapon, so a staff or a short sword or whatever else you happen to be using, you force them to make a strength save. And if they fail that saving throw, not only do they get knocked back 20 feet away from you, they also take 3d10 thunder damage. Oh, and they're also knocked prone. And of course, if you want to deal more damage on top of this, you can pump more key points in for 1d10 more damage per key point spent. And as a little treat, you get to cast the Gust of Wind cantrip as a bonus action just for the cost of 2 key points. So on your turn, you could beat someone up with an action, and then as a bonus action, throw them right into a wind tunnel. You also get another spell, Wind Wall, which can also be cast as a bonus action, once you hit level 11 and get the Breath of Wind feature. And while you can't move the wall, it still makes a pretty convincing wind sphere like the ones Aang uses in the Avatar state. And while you can't quite fly yet despite being an airbender, you do get an upgrade to your slow falling ability, which normally takes your reaction and you can only reduce so much damage, but no. Now, being an airbender, you just always have slow fall on. You take no damage from falling, and you can actually move horizontally 5 feet for every 5 feet you fall. So not full on flying, but falling. With style. So go ahead, take those leaps of faith knowing that gravity has no power over you. So I know I made a big deal out of the whole stealing air thing, which really only happens in Legends of Korra and is supposedly a lost technique, so it's pretty rare, and also not something I wanted to add here. I like big damage numbers, but this doesn't really seem like something that actually deals damage, it's just a really complicated way to choke somebody. And hey, it's D&D, if you want to choke someone, go choke them. I'm not going to stop you. But I really couldn't justify putting choking someone from a few feet away as a subclass feature. And I think I'm just going to you know, not cross the line of force asphyxiation today. So instead of that, once you hit level 11, you get Eye of the Storm, which comes with a few different benefits. At first, I had the idea of giving you a flying speed and having strong winds around you making it harder for range attacks to hit, all the while being able to cast Whirlwind. But that's just kind of the investiture of Wind Spell, which is still a part of this, so I kind of had to do a quick fix while I was writing this script. And what I came up with ended up a lot closer to Aang's early avatar state, when you could really only ever do airbending. Giving you a protective sphere of air around you that not only reduces the damage of range attacks, but also makes it really hard for melee fighters to actually get within range. The sphere has a 10 foot radius, and if someone wants to get in there and hit you, they have to push their way through the sphere, forcing it with a strength save. And if they can't, then they're stuck outside the radius, where you, with your increased range, can still give them a smack. Since you kinda get to treat your unarmed strikes and monk weapons as if they were coming from the sphere because they now have a range of 15 feet, meaning someone who is just on the edge of the sphere is just within range for a good hit. The transformation itself lasts for one minute and costs five key points to enter, so it is a little costly. And when you account for being able to cast Investiture of Wind for four key points, that's almost half your total key points by max level. But Investiture of Wind has a duration of 10 minutes, and if you cast it this way, you don't need concentration, meaning you can combo these two together for a very powerful wind form. So while you are nice and calm at the center of the storm, your enemies and possibly allies are busy fighting a hurricane. I did also include something I love from Avatar in the Patreon pack, but that is only on Patreon. 
and that is specifically the Wing Glider Staff. You know, Aang's special staff that breaks up into a Wing Glider, he uses it as a weapon, and I believe a later version of it even has a snack compartment. Hey, uh, before you go, did you remember that I wanted to talk to you guys about something? So, for those that stick around, um, would you guys like to see me take some of the, uh, let's say less fortunate subclasses from early D&D and give them a little bit of a polish or an update? I first thought of this with, well, the way of the four elements, which is clearly going for some Avatar vibes, but it just wasn't executed all that well. Some other examples of this are things like the Champion Fighter, which is just putting more fighter in your fighter. And honestly, when I heard the name Champion Fighter, my mind went to something like a Gladiator. And unfortunately, my mind was sorely disappointed. There's also the Assassin Rogue, which gets a great level 3 ability, and then turns into Hitman. Which, I mean, that's fine, Hitman is a great game series. But if you're not playing in an RP-heavy game where those disguise features are actually going to come in handy, you just have a bunch of dead levels in a subclass that you're not going to get another damaging feature for until the end. The Berserker Barbarian and the Beastmaster Ranger are just a few others. But with the Way of the Four Elements, I really just think they spread themselves too thin. They went, ooh, this can do all the main four elements, and gave it a bunch of little features, and not much else. And with a lot of new Avatar content having dropped since his subclass did, I think I have a pretty good idea of how to make something that seems more like the actual Avatar. I might start to work on these soon, but I wanted to know what you guys thought, and maybe see what kind of subclasses you think I should rework. But that is where I'll end the video for now. If you like this sort of stuff, you can check out my other videos where I go over custom monsters, subclasses, and races, or check out the Discord server if you want to join our community. That will do it for our session today, I'll see you next time, and have a wonderful day.